Hey everyone and welcome back to episode number 8 of Beyond the Dirt Podcast. I'm Hunter Slifka and this is Neil Schaefer and uh, I think today we're going to take a deep dive into uh, the CRP program or the Conservation Reserve Program. Um, as many of you may be new, uh, this last weekend was uh, Iowa pheasant opener and so a lot of blaze orange out in those fields walking the, the CRP and those buffer strips and waterways trying to get that colorful parrot up and uh, harvest a couple roosters um, this weekend and um, if you're not the one who likes to get out hunting, hopefully you're the one that likes to look at those beautiful prairie flowers and grasses um, as, the, as the months change and stuff. Um, you start to kind of see those colors pop up in May and they are, they're everlasting changing up until about these last month or so as we started to die out and dry out and things like that. But um, we, we got a lot of different opportunities when we talk about CRP and over the years it's changed a lot. Um, but we, what we always say is we, we can't tell you what it has been. We can't tell you what it's going to be. We can only tell you what it is right now. And so um, that's ultimately where we're sitting right now. Um, kind of give just a brief kind of overview is um, when we talk about CRP, there's kind of two main paths that you can go down. You can go down that continuous CRP path um, where it's a continuous open enrollment period. Um, there's a few more practices that you can jump into. And then you also have that general CRP enrollment that we usually have offered um, in December, January, February months. Um, most of the time every year, some years are a little bit different, but um, as far as enrollment periods, um, the continuous is going on right now. Um, and so we obviously had a lot of different practices. And if you guys have listened to the other podcast, uh, we went through the trivia rounds to try to name as many CRP codes and practices as possible. Um, and we got a, quite a few of them in there, uh, but but there's still definitely a lot more than what we actually mentioned. As I'm looking at the list here, um, I'm, I can tell I missed a few off the top and a few easy ones that I should have had in the back of my mind, but I guess it slipped and uh, you can't remember them all. So um, I guess if, if you want to take her over, Neil, and kind of go through some of the ones you think are maybe most important that we want to touch on right away um, or, or most popular maybe, um, we'll kind of trickle on down the list that way. You know, um, when CRP primarily got going was in the back in the mid 80s, um, partly due to the farm crisis, they wanted to put more set aside acres out and then the habitat and water quality benefits of things. But when we um, originally started with CRP and, and back in the 80s, I mean, it was, you know, the farm crisis was pretty devastating for our communities. And here came a program where you can enroll, kind of retire your land for a while and uh, set it aside and here they were getting a, a guaranteed pretty much income because uh, like I said we were in the midst a lot of people were losing land and things like that so it was widely popular and there is a rule that not more than 25 percent of the tillable acres in a county can be enrolled in CRP and we were right at that I mean it was it was crazy how much um how Howard much, County was at Howard, the 25%. Howard County was at the 25%. A lot of counties maxed out. Um, and just primarily is the economic stuff it was really the driver. It was a, a pretty devastating farm um, uh, depression. And um, the worst that we had seen since the depression of the 20s and 30s. So, um, but the thing of it was, what did they, they were putting so many acres in so quickly. What did we have to see? It was, we had, Hay, hay ground. We knew how to grow, grow, grow hay and it was primarily brome. Brome and timothy and, and you know these cool season introduced species that um, you know we did a great job. I mean farmers have been raising hay for centuries and we knew how to do that but the history of the Iowa landscape um, pre-settlement was the tall grass prairie. You had the tall grass prairie through the Iowa, Minnesota um, into Nebraska and then you got the short grass prairie on the high plains so we were kind of swimming upstream with that because yeah you, you had a lot of stuff in, in grass but um, brome grass especially it has a really um, uh, thick matted root system and over time it just gets um, root bound as it, it, it gets root bound the grasses get shorter and shorter and um, you know we were talking about it's like the uh, brome grass desert over time it didn't provide very much habitat yeah it was grass and it wasn't corn and soybeans but the, the grass has got so short that, you know, even you'd walk through there and you wouldn't even hardly see any birds. In the first years, it was really good because you had the, the oats and some of that stuff that, that came up. So um, when I started working here in uh, 2001, 
um, which was kind of cool because I, I was hired by the Dis Salt and Water District. Uh, they had received a grant from the Turkey River Pheasants Forever here in Howard County um, to promote uh, CRP buffers. So right right from the get go, that was my that was kind of what my my department was was to promote CRP. And um, you know, I started out as buffers and I worked into grass waterways and and then our list kind of grew from there. But I remember, um, you know, and I learned, you know, there was a lot on the job training. And Josh Ganson was the DNR um, wildlife biologist uh, position that he he had like four or five counties that he oversaw, and he was kind of from the Alta Vista area, uh, near the area well. And so he'd come about once a week, and we I'd be like working on my CRP stuff, and just, dude, you got to really work on promoting native grasses. On native grasses, what do you mean? What is this all about? And we at that time, I bet we had maybe. If we had five percent of the CRP was going in as natives, and and at that time was pretty limited because it was you either had straight switch, you could put straight switch grass, or you could do the the three bigs, um, big blue stem, Indian grass, and switch grass, and uh, so that was pretty much how our buffers started going, and we we had more people that started uh, were able to drill it and stuff. Well, then one of the general signups, which we, general CRP is when you place in a bid. Like Hunter said, it's like once a year in December. Um, you don't have a don't have as much play with it, and there's not as the incentives with it. But anyway, um, they started doing at least five acres of a multi-species um, and Forbes. I was like, what is Forbes? Well, Forbes are the flowers, the flowering plants on the prairie. So, and they found that was more diverse. It would help uh, aid with uh, chick rearing and stuff. So anyway, we had these little five acre plots on these fields of brome and wow, that was like, it just took off. You didn't have to fertilize it um, like brome stuff. I mean, um, the introduced species is a native here, but the native prairie plants and grasses, they don't need fertilizer because for centuries they've been growing just fine, mm -hmm. pulling that out of the ground. So anyway, so that's how we kind of, so over time, slowly we kept turning them over to natives. You mentioned fertilizing CRP and I'd be her down if I didn't say some about this, but we were down at a, a conference down in Ames and um, we were looking at different prairie plots and Matt Homers, who he's one of the best guys out there as far as giving presentations, talking about different test plots and whatever, and he was the one leading this and they were showing different test plots of straight switch versus um, pollinator plots versus a high variety of, of grasses versus a high variety of flowers and that's sort of thing showing the differences as far as nitrate removal phosphorus removal and all that kind of stuff but we got down to this one plot and it was um tall native grasses a variety mix and one was a lot more of just say i want to say probably just the switch the big blue stem and the indian grass like you talked about the big three that was at least two to three foot taller than the plot right next to it but had a, a lot more variety of grasses where there were some short grasses, some tall grasses, um, and that sort of thing. And when you seen the, the height level, the one that was fertilized was so much higher, but the actual biomass of these test strips was less. And so the fertilizer made it grow taller, but it did not improve the variety of it or the biomass of it at, at yep. any means. So you think of fertilizer when you put it on your corn, your mm -hmm. soybeans to improve that yield and whatnot. Um, it actually kind of almost did a little bit of the opposite with the native grasses, which I was just astounded with. You never would think of that. Oh, yeah. but. Yep. Well, and the other thing, especially the filter strips, um, not only do we want to control that uh, overland flow of and catch that sediment before it gets to the streams and leaves the field, but it also, you've got that uh, root system that there's water moving laterally through the soil, and that will pull up those nutrients before they also reach the stream bank and, and go in. So, you know, so with all the new knowledge I had on um, the natives and stuff, um, I started going to some trainings. One of the best trainings was NRCS put on a um, plant identification course. It was probably about at least two days. It was down at the Roadside Vegetative Management um, Center down at UNI in Cedar Falls. And uh, there was a couple of older professors there who were amazing. Um, they just really inspired us to learn the different plants, learn um, how they're raised, how to manage them. We'll talk, we'll talk a little bit about management later later on here. But, you know, so then, 
that was starting to get exciting. So then we planted a little, uh, we had uh, Rosie and Don Gooder um, own our building. And when we moved to built our new building in about 2003, 2004, um, there was a, you know, there's probably about a half an acre of lawn they were mowing next to the building. And, um, you know, sustainability is kind of one of the key words now. And instead of mowing that for the last 20 years, we, we, had, you know, we actually planted a prairie planting next to the building, which has been awesome. So when people came in, we could just take them outside and show them. And I think we're up to like 56 different varieties of grasses and flowers. <laughs> And we actually had the back side of it. Terry Hainfield was our DNR um, uh, native prairie guy for Northeast Ave. He got us the seed through Pheasants Forever. The back was tall mix with a few flowers and the front was a short mix with a lot of flowers, which that was before pollinators became a uh, key word. That was kind of a pollinator mix. And to this day, we planted that out there in the Estonian crummiest soils and talk, speak about not fertilizing. I mean, I don't even know how any of it grew. It, w it was so poor soil, it didn't raise weeds. I think we had one ragweed and like uh, just a little clump of, uh, of uh, thistle and I'd go out every summer and clip those off and they finally disappeared. But anyway, uh, we started promoting that to, to this day. Now, to where we're at now, I would say 99.9% .9 of all the CRP that we're doing now is, is uh, um, made of prairie grasses. Yeah, and it provides so much more benefits. I mean, um, I mean, even just the other day, we had a little bit of change in one of our programs. And um, whenever we're talking about benefits on the landscapes, whether it's farming, native prairie, whatever it may be, you only, or even like you talk about your own health diet. If you can have a variety of, of foods you're eating or a variety of crops you're growing, a variety of species out there in the landscapes, that's always better than a monoculture. Mm -hmm. And so that's ultimately what we're trying to do when we talk about these native prairies is we want a variety of different plants or seeds out there to provide to the different ecosystems, the different animals, the different bugs, the insects, whatever may be out there because that's what's going to ultimately keep that life cycle going and, and continue to spin rather than just having one monoculture of brome, let's say. Um, I mean, you can definitely tell, I mean, if any of you guys are hunters out there, you can definitely tell that those pheasant numbers, those turkey numbers, um, those upland bird numbers are really starting to grow um, and you get down into southern Iowa and you're really starting to see that quail population take off. I just talked to one of my buddies uh, who lives down in Winterset and uh, actually he was hunting with uh, Al Lang down there um, who uh, we're going to have to definitely send this one off to. Um, he was the uh, NRCS CRP director for quite a few years and he's been uh, promoted up to the big desk you could say um, out to DC and so they were able to harvest a few quail out there at their farm. Um, this last weekend, which is just phenomenal. I mean, I think you're going to start to see those quail numbers start to rise. Um, you're going to see them start to migrate up here north as, as we get those um, prairies on the landscape, see that variety of mixes and whatnot. Um, like you see, you got that CP33 quail buffer in there. Um, and so there's a lot of different ways that we can attract those kinds of birds and then be able to grow those healthy populations um, as we've done with the ringneck pheasant um, up here in Howard County. So um, there's a lot of different programs and uh, Neil, why don't you take it right away? I know waterways are one of your favorites, but let's hold off on that one. If yep. you could pick any other CRP practice on this list. So if you guys don't know, we're looking at a cheat, le cheat sheet right now um, that is all the CRP practices. It's got all the different um, contract lengths. It's going to be backwards, but um, nonetheless, it gives us pretty much every information that we need to know um, as far as what entails in each CRP practice code because... Um, CRP is a big umbrella and within the CRP there's like we said 50 60 different actual codes or practices that then can fall under depending on your soil types your buffer strips your whole fields pollinate whatever you want to talk about so if you had to pick one Neil mm -hmm. other than grass waterways what is your favorite well there's there's two of our newest ones oh no, no 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 I said I'm one gonna say two one no, I'm gonna bad say dog. Two. two. Bad dog. There's one. two because they kind of go hand in hand because one. Okay. This is how complicated CRP can be. I mean, we've got a lot of, like Hunter says, there's a lot of variety of what we can do, but they've also given us several different options in our CRP toolbox, if you you like to say. But um, two of the newer ones were the CP42 and the CP43. See, and they're right next to each other, okay. even on the list. Right. But, uh, Neil, you fail the test. No, so that's that, those are my favorites. You do not your two hundred dollars. No. I'm go sorry. To jail. Nope, I'm sorry. 
we're going to uh, delve into the pollinator. Uh, so everybody knows about the, mo uh, the butterfly, the monarch um, butterfly. And so their numbers have been going down, whether it's due to habitat where they overwinter down in Mexico or um, they're, they're on their voyage up to Canada and back and stuff like that. But anyway, there was a big push on it and it kind of serves twofold. So when we were doing those general CRPs and beginning to transform them from the brome to a mix, we, we started doing these, we call them a CP25 mix. And it was kind of, generally it was like five grasses or 10 grasses and uh, 15 flowers. But here we found out from the biologists that that's where the pheasants like to also rear their young because there was more bugs there. It wasn't as thick with grass, the little birds, the, the baby birds could like maneuver in and around. So um, there was a big push um, probably in that eight, eight years ago uh, time frame to do as much pollinator as we could. So we really went out. There was a lot of extra incentives um, and currently now we can put like 10% of a tract into it. So you can find those odd um, little spots like you've got the low return on investment areas of a farm. Um, so we can put some pollinator on a gravelly knoll. Um, pays pretty good. It's got some good incentives on it, good rental payments. And then the other one is a CP43 strips program where, um, you know, they've found out that you can put, I believe it's 10% of a field into strips across it and around it. Um, and it'll reduce, um, uh, nutrients leaving by the farm by over 50%. I mean, it's, it's just tremendous just having that little strip through there. So those two, we have a lot of flexibility and where we can place that on the land. You know, we've, I've always like say, I coined the phrase, but I'm sure I didn't farm the best buffer the rest. Um, like we've said in previous uh, podcasts, we're, we need to feed the, the country and a lot of the world depends on what our food production here. So obviously we have to have working grounds. And, um, and that was the one thing um, when we were doing so much, you know, we had 25% of the, the uh, cropland in, in CRP and stuff. I mean, that was obviously way to the other extreme. Um, so anyway, they've, they've, they uh, took away, they, instead of doing quantities, we're doing more of a quality. Um, and that was a big thing, um, you know, in the last 10 years is changing over those brome grass deserts into a very diverse um, mix. Um, and now we're even diverse, we're even making them more diverse. So we'll get into that with our, our brand new programs here in a little bit. But yeah, I would say those are competent. So obviously, you know, you got your filter strips and that kind of stuff too. But um, I, I do like the flexibility and just the idea. And not only the uh, monarch butterfly, but there's a lot of pollinators out there that are taking advantage of these. You've got um, rusty the Rusty Patch, Patch Bumblebee. Bumblebee, which believe it or not, we went to Rusty Patch Bumblebee training. And uh, we didn't see any that day, but they are they are a, a species of bumblebee. I think we've got like um, 25, 30 different bumblebee spe species in Iowa that are native. And there's, I mean, there's probably eight or 80 or 90 regular bees and wasps and that kind of thing. But also bats, um, there's birds that are pollinators. Um, so anyway, it, it does a lot of, there's a lot of benefit and you don't have to have that much, um, especially for bees and pollinators. They would much rather have a plot Okay, if you had a, a choice between a 200 acre block of prairie, which has some benefits for some of the wildlife, or would you rather have 10, uh, let's see, 20 blocks of 10 acres of pollinator spread over several miles. For, for pollinators, those smaller patches are kind of like those oasis um, amongst the corn and soybean fields that would be more beneficial. So, um, so like I said, there's a lot of different tools in our box with that. And, um, but I'm going to back up a little bit. Howard County has had a tradition of, of CRP um, and the farmers using the CRP program uh, extensively. I mean, the 20 years I've been here, they've been right in that top top five in the number of contracts. And always the number of acres because we got some counties in southern Iowa and eastern Iowa that have more acres. They have larger size in, in their county too. But for the number of contracts, we've been in that, you know, three, four, five ranking for many, many years. So that shows um, our farmers know, and we've done a really good job of, of fine tuning these programs so that we're taking those edges along a, a grove. You know, what well, I've said too, the, the, one of the best tools for us in managing where we 
uh, target the CRP is the um, uh, yield monitor maps. You know, you, someone comes in and they've got their yield monitor maps and all around the perimeter of their field is the lowest yields. Well, it could be because it's got high traffic area, could be because there's um, shadowing or um, uh, from tree lines and things like that. And plus farmers invest a lot of money in, in equipment. And if we've got a, a brushy fence line or tree line, you really don't want to have your machinery right next to that either. So that's an easy sell. You go 120, 60 feet from the edge of that. Um, so that that uh, fine tuning, I, I call it conser precision conservation planning. You kind of pick those low return on investment areas, um, whether it's with grass waterways, um, the filter strips along these creeks and streams and things like and you know, we shouldn't just mention that we have the prairie grasses. We also have tree programs. Um, we have the field windbreak where you can put two to um, eight rows of trees around a perimeter of farm. You'll see a lot. Uh, two of, to ten. Two to ten. Yeah. See, this is why. This is why we got all these columns, <laughs> so I don't have to memorize everything. I've got a lot of it memorized, but um, but this is kind of a handy tool. So when somebody comes in, we can like, oh look, our minimum rows are two, maximum ten. Well, anyway, we've got the tree program that does that. We also have a farmstead windbreak where you can put, um, better look at my list here, 16A. Man, 16 rows. We could put, I did, I have done a 16 a row. Trees. It is. And what we do is we make a whole lot of different, we've got different species of the pine tree. We've put some oaks, some walnut. Um, then we do a lot of, of shrubs that have um, nuts and berries and stuff on it. And what's really cool about, um, making those tree plantings and stuff too is you each row of trees has its own biosphere or own ecosystem within itself I mean you start on the outside you got these thick bushy species whether it's high bush cranberry um, lilacs whatever you want to put on those outside which is a really good cover for the birds to get into it I say it's basically like your barbed wire fence from the, the predators I mean a coyote or a fox doesn't want to go running through that stuff and then you start to get into your conifers, your pines. Then you start to get in your hardwoods with your nuts, your berries, that sort of thing. And then you could even start to kind of start over again. And you could put another row of those bushier trees and stuff like that. And so it's really fun when you start to design them and, and start to put them together as far as what the landowner wants and, and wants to be able to present out there as far as habitat, windbreak cover, um, food, whatever it may be. I mean, that's where you ultimately always start to take their goals in and, and start to really kind of tailor it to what they like. But um, you mentioned that your favorite practices were the pollinator and the prairie strips. Mine's also two practices, but we always kind of lump it as one. And when you were talking about it, I thought you were going to pick the exact one I wanted to. Um, but I like the CP2728. It's a farmable wetland program. And the reason why that's probably my favorite, it's, it's very close between that and the gaining ground now that it's changed. But... Um, there's so much flexibility with it as to what we can do, the farmer can do, um, designing that sort of thing. So if the CP2728, when you basically come down it, it can be a, it's a shallow wetland pond with a native buffer around the outside of it. Um, and there's different requirements as far as size and whatnot. But basically what we're looking for is that you got those hydric soils, those wet soils. So if you got a wet spot out in the field a lot of years, you're not able to farm with that sort of thing. Um, this is a great avenue to go down. Um, and we can really start to carve out or make that shape how you like to. We always talk about uh, a kidney bean shape where you're kind of a little bit larger on the outside ends. It comes a little bit narrower in the middle. Uh, we like putting those goose islands or duck islands, whatever you want to call it, in the middle, which every time you do that, almost before the project's even completed, you got a pair of geese or a goose out there, especially if you're building in the springtime. And that did happen. That's just south of town here. I went out to uh, do some survey check out on it and here I heard this honking and honking here I look and they had like rolled up a bunch of the the clods of dirt and here she was already sitting on mm -hmm. eggs and they had just left I bet they hadn't left that just three four days earlier and there wasn't even water in the pond yet and uh, here they had already anticipated it might have just been a little bit probably just enough to attract them but uh, eventually it filled up but they have had birds on that ever since um, you know, sometimes it's that same uh, pair that comes back each year. Yeah, and it's really cool because like with these structures, almost always we try to put in a, a water control box or a box structure, um, which is a, basically a, a rectangle or a square box that gets dug into the ground and then has those stop logs in there to control the water level. And which is really cool where 
um, these landowners, farmers, whatever it is who may be putting these in, can use it to their goals. If they're a big wetland um, bird hunter, waterfowl hunter, they're able to pull those stop logs out midsummer, seed a bunch of down a bunch of millet or a waterfowl uh, feeding species, let it start to head out, and then that week or so before um, duck season, goose season, whatever it is, they'll they'll put the stop logs back out, flood it out, and it provides a great habitat area, a great food supply um, for those waterfowl birds. Um, or if it's just a, a person who just wants to set it and leave it, there's nothing wrong with that too. We're always getting those great nutrient reductions, um, having that ponded water, that water surface out there, and, and having that churning of the waves and whatnot out there. Um, they're really awesome. And we've done anything from half acre size shallow wetlands up to, I think probably the biggest is a couple, two, three acre um, and water surface and stuff. And so um, it really depends on, on what you want out there. But the other cool part about it was, um, I want to say it was three, four years ago, um, we had some restrictions with CRP where we weren't able to put those whole fields in um, with just putting it in one program, one species or one mix of grasses and stuff. Um, and so being that wasn't available, we were able to refer back to the CP2728 to get some of those whole fields put in if they had the right soils. Mm -hmm. And so we were able to get pretty much, um, I don't know, probably 75% of those fields in that weren't eligible or weren't able to re-enroll back into the original practice and we were able to do the kind of the groundwork for them and get it put into that CP 2728. Well, like Connor said, the hydric soils, Howard County is a, a wet county. Um, we have one of the glaciations of, of North Iowa um, brought some blue clay. It's, it's down probably anywhere from four to 10, 15 feet below the surface. But there's this layer of blue clay that came in that's pretty impervial to water going through. So that's how you ended up with Howard County being one of the wettest counties. Uh, you know, we weren't the Prairie Pottle area, but with that layer of that blue clay in there, um, it was it was pretty swampy. So that was the other thing. We had a lot of prairies in Iowa. The other thing was a lot of wetlands. And both have been depleted by, you know, upwards of 95 to 98% or, or have been converted from that. So it's very easy to create these farmable wetland programs um, for CRP where they shallow um, excavations um, and like Hunter said the outlighting daylighting the tile into it um, you know sometimes you got these wetter areas of the field and um, peat beds I mean we've got some peat if you try to farm that there's a, a problem with it because what it is peat is a very high in organic of, of organic material so it's like a mound of this peat peat bog or whatever and because it stayed wet all the time, it never deteriorated. So you come in here and you tile it, dry it out, the air gets to it, it starts deteriorating, it starts sinking. Well, what happens is the tile line starts sagging. Then all of a sudden now you've got a stretch of tile that doesn't drain because it's lower than the rest of it. So you might be able to tile it. I've seen people put tile every 15 feet through this stuff and it works for a few years. So anyway, so that's a really neat area we can put into. Um, we also have these fens. There used to be a lot of fens and we actually, that was kind of cool. We were out <clears throat> in my watershed and they, they said, you know, we we're only able to farm this one part of our field every, you know, every three or four years. It's so too wet they can't plant it. So with the cropping history, you should also back up that CRP has to be on land that's been row cropped, has a history of, of being certified as cropland. Um, so that's how we work with the FSA department. Um, so when somebody comes in, they're interested in this. We send it over door next door to see if they've got that cropping history. So what they do is they go back in time. Um, I can't remember right now. It's like years 2014 through 19 or something like that. And you have to have five, five out of four out of six of those years in row crop. So anyway, with the wetland program, it can be a little bit less. So uh, we get out there and we're like walking around and kind of thinking about putting one of these shallow excavations in and. They're like, well, there's the wettest area over there. So we were walking over there and we're just like walking uphill until we got on it. And if, uh, fens are a very unique um, landform in, in Iowa. If you, you kind of jump on them and it, the, it, the ground kind of quakes like jello um, because there's so much water held up in this organic. I mean, we were jumping on the landowners like, don't jump so hard, we're gonna sink right into it, hmm. like quicksand. But anyway, so we found a fen and um, we, uh, we, we didn't have to do any excavating on that because it had the 
it had not uh, been able to produce crops on it, but it was that peat bed. So we, so that was kind of cool. So we plant a different type of grasses on those and flowers. We go with what they call a hydric mess. You got your meso, meso mix is the drier species like on the uplands and then your hydric mixes. So we kind of fine tune it to that too. But yeah, I would agree that, that that's probably one of, one of my favorite ones, but just as far as um, ability to use it in conjunction with the, the landscape and the farmer wanting to produce crop and things, the 43 has really been a lot of, it's had a lot of flexibility in, in what we want to do and getting rid of point rows and, and um, putting those borders around fields and things like that. Yeah, and uh, I guess we'll, we'll let you have your fame here, but I'm, you can't go too elaborate. Um, let's talk about the grass waterways because we do a ton of these. Last year we did um, was about 30 miles worth of waterways just last year. Yep. And I did say that right, 30 miles. 30 miles. Not so 30 feet. That's crazy. 30 miles of waterway. We could construct a waterway from our office all the way out to the far east side of Decorah and then some yeah. a little bit farther. Well, that's, you know, I think a, a county is about 30 miles wide. I mean, that'd be like building a, a waterway from one edge of the county to the other. It ended up, there was 110 practice uh, farms we did, practice. 110 um, contracts. Um, some some only needed 600 feet of waterway. Some needed 6,000 feet of waterway. Mm -hmm. So we, uh, but that was where we get back to this whole cropping history. So if, let's say you've got a farm, you've been farming it, you know, fence line to fence line, and, you know, rain doesn't come, you know, one inch a week or half an inch one day and half next and next. It doesn't rain for six, six weeks and then we get nine inches in 20 minutes. I mean, that, that, that um, has, it's definitely job security when it comes to waterways. But I've always said putting waterways in is kind of like putting your infrastructure in your roadways and things. We're, uh, we're, we're uh, shaping and grassing down those, um, um, those high uh, flow lines through the fields, concentrated flow, that's what I was thinking of. Um, so you've got your, your fields in the hills and the valleys, that water always comes down the center and that's your concentrated flow. So with CRP, um, incentive rates are in just in crazy right now because you've get, you get your rental, you know, $300 an acre is usually what waterways are doing right now. The rental rate for the acres that go into being seeded down and then you got a what they call a 50 percent cost share and then a 40 percent practice incentive payment which is 40 percent on top of the 50 so that gets you to 90 percent once the practice is complete and it's completed when we get the final uh, permanent seeding put on so if we build them in the fall and we come back in the spring that's when it's finished and then as of the last couple years they have this additional 10 percent that after we go back and look at it in year four um, and everything's going well, if it needs any touch up, we do it at that time, but they'll pay that additional 10% of the cost. So honestly, it's 100%. And on top of that, it's even a little better than that because you get the signing incentive payment, which is one third of your rental payment. So you're getting $100 right off the bat per acre just signing the contract. So anyway, you gotta go back to that cropping history. So if these are gullies that are in your crop field, you know, we'll, we'll get a phone call usually it's usually in the spring after we've had spring rains or in the fall. Um, and we like to get out there early in the spring, early summer and get that stuff surveyed so we can start working on designs all summer long so we're ready to hit the ground running in the fall as soon as that crop comes off. But we do have some that don't realize they've got those gullies so they go to harvest. So we try to have as much work done ahead of time so that we can kind of fit those also into there. So anyway, when uh, considering waterways, and the reason they're so important is they do such a great job of reducing sediment delivery and, uh, and decreasing how much sediment is leaving your field. So you take an acre of gully area of a field where we're gonna put a waterway, say it's 1200 feet long, 40 foot wide, it's about an acre. And before we put the grass waterway in, you're losing 45 tons of soil per acre, 45 tons. That's 90,000 pounds, correct? I believe. That's a lot. Just think of that. That's a lot. So after we've shaped it and then grass it down, it goes down to one. It goes from 45 tons per year annual sediment leaving your field down to one. That's that's awesome. That's amazing. That's probably, and that's probably, yeah. Well, he said I would say that was my favorite. It kind of is. But just because, uh, 
I just like to see that, you know, when you're crossing the field, you know, we, we, we shape these, they're designed as um, um, parabolic, which means it's kind of bowl shaped. So you got that easy transition across and, you know, they may be 30, 40, 50 feet wide, usually one foot deep to a foot and a half. And so that's pretty crossable. And that's what we want you to do. We want you to plant across your field, across the waterway so that water gets to that waterway. Um, and the crop history end of it, if it doesn't meet eligibility, let's say it's been kind of, you kind of were grassing and it didn't really, wasn't really holding, or it was done years ago and it's now washing on both sides and you've ended up with three waterways instead of one and the grass area isn't doing any good, then we'll use state cost share or one of the other programs um, for getting it back in shape. But yeah, that was, that was crazy. That was probably our biggest year. We averaged maybe 20 to 25 acres or 20 to 25 miles of waterways a year that we do through our office. And that's all the programs, the CRP waterways, state cost share waterways, project waterways. Um, but um, that, but like I said, that you get that done, that's the main part for getting that sediment reductions uh, done. And then we'll work with the landowner on, on those upland acres. Kind of like what I said, find the best buffer the rest. Why are you putting crops, uh, fertilizer and seed in those gullies that wash out and it's hard on your machinery trying to cross it. I've, I've ridden with uh, people in combines and stuff and man, you get to that gully and you got to slow down, you got to adjust your, your head on your combine and then get through and then you boom, boom, boom. Um, so yeah. Well, you even got projects like yesterday, we were all flagging a waterway where you can't even get to the center of the waterway. I mean, there's a gully that's a two to three foot deep, mm -hmm. minimal. Yeah. That was the smaller cuts on both sides of the waterway. So A, you can't even drive across, whether mm -hmm. we got an ATV, a combine, a trail, whatever it is, you ain't getting across. And that was minimal. And then you have some other spots that was four foot, five foot head cuts. I mean, mm -hmm. you could lose a, a, an adult in those. Yeah, I mean, and sometimes you, you you drive by a farm for years and you say, oh, look, they got nice waterways. And you get out there and man, it's like a foot drop off the side of the grass into the field and you've got all this erosion on each side of it, which really um, hasn't solved anything. So anyway, it's it's a lot of, it's very interesting. Um, you, you could send 10 different people out to a field with, bat with a handful of flags and they'll flag it a little bit different you, you get can be somewhat creative um over time you get a feel for it you want the a nice gentle you know if we're you know a lot of times the water is just going zig 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 back and forth like a snake cross field you know we we have some ability to straighten that out somewhat put those more gentle turns and stuff but one of the nicest things that's come along in technology with the farmers have are these shut off planters and sprayers. They can go in GPS the perimeters of their fields, GPS all their waterways in, and as they're driving across the field planting or spraying, those nozzles or those uh, seed drops will automatically turn off. And we had a producer, we just did a waterway. Um, you know, sometimes people are trying to, you know, and they're kind of plan into it and all that. But man, if you've got that technology, um, it was so cool. It was just a, the crispest edge you could ever imagine. Um, so yeah, technology is really helping us out with the conservation uh, aspects of things too. But um, yeah, those grass waterways. So when we go out, the first time we'll go out, um, I'm usually, Hunter is getting all the survey equipment ready to go and I grab a, a handful of flags and I start walking. And sometimes you're walking and then you turn around and it's like, ah, that's not quite right. So then you're walking back and moving those. Um, and then you, you kind of do it and then I walk back, kind of tweak it again. And then we go along, we shoot those. Um, every 100 feet, I'm putting a flag in for our center line. We shoot that, and then every 400 feet, we do a cross section. Um, so we take that center shot, we go out 25 feet, and then 50, then 50. And so if we're trying to great, get some grade out there, um, sometimes we have to go a little bit further than that. But even with that, the technology of our survey equipment, I mean, we've got um, just um, the NRCS provides us with the top notch latest uh, equipment. Um, I remember going out, you know, you know I'm not going to date myself. Hunter always wants to talk about my age, but I mean, I had the, the debate is still out there. How old is Neil Sheev? If you <laughs> can guess it right, we'll give you a prize. I'm old enough to know enough not to say anything about my age. Anyway, so we go, I've, I've used a hand level even. That takes two people. So you're out there with a hand level and you can't have somebody stand out so many feet and you can get your grades and stuff like that. But then we also had the laser level, which was, it was fun. It was kind of a challenge. You'd have 
you know, you had to set it and it was like spinning out there and you had to have it exactly set level. And then you'd set it and then you start serving. You had this 25 foot rod. So you'd start out and you, as the further down the slope you went, the more rod went out. And, you know, you got these windy days and the rod was made of a flexible um, fiberglass. And um, so you've got that thing just waving in the wind. And um, Hunter got in on that because when he first started with us, we were still using those. And if you got to, got down the slope of a field and you ran out of rod, you had to move your your uh, transit and stuff down. And so, man, when they got this GPS unit, you just go down. Now we've got a tablet when we're out there. You can see us moving through the field. You can go right back to where we put that point. Um, it's It's been great. So anyway, so that's, that's another big part of the CRP. And probably besides the cost of planting seed, native seed in a field, um, probably I, we should actually add up how much cost share that 110 uh, waterway projects because it does stimulate the local economy. Conservation can bring um, money back to the community as far as economic development. Not only are we improving the water and reducing soil erosion and things like that, it does stimulate and we've got um, outstanding contractors. Um, we've, probably, we've got a list of a, a dozen or more people that build waterways. Um, we've got a list of six, seven, eight people that do um, the native seed drilling. Um, that's one of the things, you know, now we should probably pivot back towards the, the native prairie a little bit. Just to say, establishment of it, um, what we're usually doing is going out there and we're having these discussions with people now for new CRP that's going in next spring. Let's say it was in corn stocks this fall. Um, one of the best things is if you can take those corn stock bales off there, get a lot of that residue off. So then in the spring, we can hit it with herbicide to catch any of those annual flush of weeds in early May. And then we can go right in with a no-till drill and drill right into that corn stocks. The best bed, seed bed prep is to have soybeans the year before. You don't have to do anything other than hit it with herbicide in the spring. And there you go with your native drill. And being that you have less disturbance using that native drill, you haven't stirred up that uh, seed bank because in the top uh, foot of soil, I forget, it's just a tremendous number of seed, weed seeds that are in that soil. And every time you disturb it, you, you um, uh, excite that seed to where it wants to germinate. So if we can get in there and um, get that native grasses growing, then in the first year, you're going to mow it two or three times. And, um, you know, we like to say the first year it sleeps, the second year it creeps, and the third year it leaps. Um, so having, uh, especially, it's been kind of tough for some farmers, you know, their pride is to have the, a weed-free field of corn and soybeans and stuff. And here, so we're planting this very diverse mix of grasses and, and, uh, and uh, forbs, prairie flowers. And honestly, it's like, I got people that like, all I got out here is weeds. And I'm like, so we go out and we do our reassurance. And, um, and honestly, we get out there and we're like, we start pointing out and identifying all these little plants and, and uh, they're like, oh man, I thought I had weeds. And I said, no, you've got a beautiful um, first, first year of planting. And that's where the ID courses have really helped us out. Um, I even went to an advanced class where it was not only uh, identifying the flower on the, the mature plant and the seed head and that's, that's, that's kind of easy. I actually went to a, a three day training on how to identify the immature plant. <clears throat> which I think is very important because that's when farmers are um, and landowners are really having difficulties with wrapping their head around what we've done as they see this all these things growing out there and if we can get in there and start identifying those as, as new plants um, that reassures them and and uh, sometimes you just gotta look the other way and uh, do that so then uh, we get this stuff established and part of when we do these whole fields we'll put a fire break so we'll plan a a uh, ring of uh, cool season grasses. So <clears throat> we are still using that because your cool season grasses are the ones that start greening up first in the spring. The other thing about native prairie plants, almost all of them are what we consider warm season grasses and flowers. And the reason we don't really, the optimum plant time to plant this is like around Memorial Day, because they're not gonna really get going and germinating until temperatures are in that 67 degree range. And then, uh, so anyway, we put this fire break around the outside, 20 to 30 foot strip of cool season grasses, which the farmer will be mowing that more often than the rest of the field. And the reason they're doing that is prepping it for, I'll turn it over to the fireman. <laughs> yeah, so we like doing a lot of fire burns. 
Um, that's one of the most uh, important management tools. Uh, we we're talking about CRP, and Neil alluded to the, the first couple establishment loans in that first and second year. Um, but then be able to have a really good, healthy fire burn in that fourth, fifth, sixth year is probably the next most important thing because um, obviously these grasses come back every year. They reseed themselves. You get more and more material out there. Well, if you don't burn that off, get that old material off, off of there, you're going to create this really heavy mat on top. You're going to start to smother out some of those young plants. The di diversity is going to start to go down, and you're not going to have that healthy variety um, CRP out there. Kind of just like if um, people in town, um, when you're out there and you're taking off leaves on your, on your lawn, if you leave that heavy mat of leaves out there, you're going to smother out your grasses underneath and you're not going to have your grasses come back. It's the exact same uh, idea out there. And so being able to have these fire breaks um, for a couple reasons. One, so we have an access out there. We have a great protection between whatever, uh, whether it's housing, forest, timber area, whatever it may be, having that 15 to 30 foot strip in between is very, very crucial. Um, and it can really, really um, speed up a fire burn. I know some of these times, um, being on the fire de department, when we go out and actually do these fire burns, if there's no fire break out there, obviously at some point in the field, your wind's not going to be correct. And it, it can be very daunting. It can take a lot of time to get that back burn going, um, to get that 10 to 15, 20, 30 foot swath burned off so you don't have to worry about that overburn and catching something else next to it. And so... Um, honestly, it can cut a fire, a prescribed burn in half as far as time comes to it um, because it, it, it is very time consuming. It can be very dangerous. It can be very um, important to get that, that back burn and get that little bit of a lane burnt off so you don't have to worry about it. But then once it starts to go, um, you get that burnt off. And it's, I think it's one of the most pretty things to see that complete charred black out there um, just because you know that green growth is coming really, really quickly. Um, and, it, and it's a very important tool and then some of these contracts you get paid for it some you don't every year is a little bit different um, But nonetheless it is it is an extremely important tool to be able to get out there and get a great burn on it whether it's a small um, Waterway a small buffer strip um, A 10 acre plot or 150 160 200 acre CRP plot out there um, Those fire burns are really really important. Well, you know, and I struggled a little, a little bit years ago finding people who help landowners with the burns because we do not want, you know, we want these to be prescribed controlled burns and nothing worse than fires getting out of control. Um, so uh, we started working with the fire departments and there's six fire departments in the area. So they've kind of divvied up the area kind of on their boundaries. <clears throat> so a lot of the, um, which serves two things. First off, we're getting the management practice done on the farm, on the, on the CRP. It's also a good fundraising for our local fire departments. And so, um, and I've always said it's better to call them ahead of time and do the fire than to light the match and have to call them because your barn's on fire. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it's, it's just a win-win for everybody involved. And like I said, the fire is the best uh, uh, management practice for the prairie because back in history of prairie on Iowa's landscape, you either had fires started by lightning and that would naturally burn. And that's where our soils are so um, rich here in the Midwest is over years and years of all this prairie, you know, between just that's growing the organic material and then the burns and then that is a layer. And then another thing, which is kind of neat when we learn this, when we go to cultural resource training, um, with our state archeologists is, um, the native Americans would use fire as a management tool on the prairie to, to, in a way to herd bison. They observed that after these natural fires, where did the bison go after those fires when all that new fresh growth came up? Because if you ever walk through a prairie um, when it's dry, we just did some hunting here with our youth a couple weeks ago, and man, it's it's kind of scratchy and itchy and um, pretty pretty nasty. And think of just munching on that dry CRP, but man, you get that fire goes through there, and what a pretty beautiful um, the prairie looks so nice that first year after a fire because all that old duff and old material is gone. You got all this new flower. You can see the flowers blooming better, but it's really tender and, and uh, nutritious for bison. So that was a kind of a neat thing that we kind of learned to how the Native Americans even managed the prairie with fire. So mm -hmm. we're kind of, and our goal is with prairie and with soil health, and we're going to get to one of the soil health pod podcasts here one of these days, is to try to mimic nature instead of 
fighting it constantly and and we can do that with uh, the native um, establishment and some other things we can do on, on uh, working lands too. And I know a lot of people <clears throat> always like to do it themselves, try to save some pennies and whatnot, but really when you think about it, uh, most of the fire departments in the area um, are about the same going rate, but roughly it's, it's usually about a $300 to a $350 minimum um, and then about $30 an acre roughly mm -hmm. in that in that realm. So that's, that's pretty cheap when you're talking about uh, burning some grasses versus having to pay for a new vehicle that you burned up, mm -hmm. pay for a new barn that got burnt down that maybe was over 100 years old. Maybe uh, you get hurt, whatever it may be. Um, it's, it's always a lot safer, a lot cheaper to just call your local fire department, help those guys out because they're always looking um, to help do some fundraising. And it's always a great training opportunity to get out there. Um, and lastly, before I forget those fire breaks, other than just um, helping with the fire burn aspect, it's also a great opportunity to, for some management to keep those trees out because mm -hmm. um, you got those overhanging limbs, you got the trees right next to it, those birds are going to then disperse some of that seed, the, the seed's going to get blown into those CRP fields. If you can keep that 15 to 30 foot fire break mowed, you're going to keep out a high majority of those trees. I mean, yep. when we see trees encroaching on CRP, I would say probably a high 75% or more, probably close to that 90%. Are areas that are right next to forest land mm -hmm. they're started to just very slowly work themselves in if you don't take care of them right away it well, blows up like a mushroom and yeah, they're all over really yeah fast. and they get they start getting the trees get thicker and then that makes the grasses thinner and then when you go to burn it then there's no fuel to carry that fire through those mm -hmm. trees and then then you're done you you got to mechanically remove those so yeah there's some really good management with it and um like also, there's a very small window of opportunity to do this in the spring. I mean, we want the conditions dry enough. You got to have wind has to be in the right direction and not too too much. You have to have a certain humidity as, as kind of a, a super low humidity compared to a high humidity it has a tremendous effect on the burn and the quality because we want it to be hot enough to take out those invasive species and yet um, enough to carry that flame through. So, and it is pretty. I, I actually saw uh, some night burns this last year and I took some pictures of some of those. And man, you talk about beautiful, you know, a nice calm um, early spring night. And here you're seeing this uh, fire out in the, on, the perim on the horizon. Um, the other thing too is you know it's a good day. You see uh, all these plumes of white smoke going up and it goes pretty fast. I mean, you can burn a, an area if it's well planned and we've got those blocks of, of CRP divided out with um, fire breaks and not only around the perimeter but we'll put those uh, divide those fields up so that we're not burning ideally we want to go back um, in a series of years and burn a certain percentage of it sometimes it's not um, that easy if it's a smaller field or something but it's nice to have that just so that we're we've got those oases in there where um, um, birds and and, and not only birds and, and pheasants and things like that, but there's a lot of like the bees and a lot of these pollinators, um, they reside in the stems from the year before. So if we're burning it all off at a certain time, especially with the rusty patch bumblebee, um, that's one of the trainings we had is the timing of the burns is important because in their, their life cycle, they're using some of that old um, previous year's um, growth for habitat until they're out and uh, out and about in the spring. So anyway, so there's a lot, lot to do with that. Um, over the years, it's just gotten better and better. We've got more, uh, we've got more people pro providing the seed. Um, so we have more diverse mixes. The prices have come down. Um, and then the, the people that are doing the drilling and stuff are just doing a great job. So some of these prairies in the first year, we've got flowers blooming. Um, there's nothing more beautiful than, you know, late summer, um, early fall, you've got this Indian grass, which is just this golden color. Um, and then the switchgrass, it just looks like this fluffy, soft field. You want to almost just go out and lay in. It's like a cloud. And then the, the big blue stem's got this purplish, purple cast to it. Um, so yeah, there's, there's nothing prettier than a, a waving field of prairie grass out on, on the prairie. So, um, but like I said, we're in an ag production state, so we're going to be doing um, you know, kind of stick with our motto, find the best buff the rest. And some of that CRP that does come out, some of these old whole farm ones, especially back in the day when, when it was all brome, we spend just as much time working with those landowners, putting in waterways, buffer strips, and windbreaks and things like that. So um, there is, that's one of the reasons, you know, we've got, we lead the state in the number of CRP contracts is 
where we've got such a diverse toolbox of these CRP practices. So, so that's always fun sitting down with the farmer and, and doing some of these plans with them when they come in. It's like they give us what well, we say, the resource concerns, and then we start to go to work um, designing some of these. And sometimes we go back to the drawing board three or four times to get it right mm -hmm. um, to, to fit everybody's, uh, you know, we got to follow the rules of the program. Um, the eligibility would work with our FSA uh, partners next door, um, what the landowner's abilities and what desires are, and, um, you know, timing and the land form. I mean, every farm is going to be different. So what works on one farm is not going to probably work that great on the next farm. So that's what Hunter and I are here for is to to um, wade through all the the bureaucracy and the programs and all the all the all the technical end of it to provide a, a, a plan a conservation planning for them to sign and, and uh, get it up and running. Yeah. Um, before we sign off, I think we talked about all these CRP codes. Let's go through all of them. Just say the number, give a quick up one one sentence mm -hmm. maybe what it really is and we're just going to keep on moving down the list so all right. you know if you want to take them. the fruit we'll just go every other if you want to start at the bottom we'll try to work from the low numbers and work our way through so how it kind of works is each practice has a cp code a conservation practice code and then it has a number behind it which correlates to what the actual practice is um and so we'll start right away i'll let neil take it over at the cp1 okay so we've got this program it's called the wellhead protection and in the state of Iowa, we've got these, um, they call it a uh, source water protection. And we've got these project coordinators that help out with that. And what we're trying to do with that program is to help protect municipal water supplies. So within, a, I think it's a one or two mile radius of a city water tower, we have a priority zone where we can go in and we can put these programs. There's a CP1, which is the non-native uh, CRP. CP2 is the, um, uh, the native grasses, a CP3A is a hardwood tree planting, and then the 4D is a habitat type program. So those, you know, that's a very specialized, I know we've, we've done some of that down in the Protovin area. We've got some water uh, CRP that's within the water tower area. So um, so anyway, that's kind of a unique people. People don't realize that, but it's a very limited number of people that would actually be involved in that. But it's something that it's kind of nice to have that flexibility, especially for municipalities who are supplying water to thousands of people. Mm -hmm. And then kind of a, I wouldn't say a branch off it, but almost kind of the same idea as the HELI program. It has those same different codes, the CP1, 2, 3A, 4D, but it also has a CP25, which is then the native grasses that gets paired with it. And this is a program that um, can get enrolled into highly erodible land is what it is. Heli, H-E-L-I, highly erodible land. Yep, you have um, to say they do what it's called an erosion index and they take your land soils, the slope of the land, and it has to have a certain percentage. So those those steeper grounds, um, have that's an automatic. They can go right into that program. And so when we say farm the best, buffer the rest, that's really the kind of the keystone, capstone area when we talk about that highly erodible land, having those practices that are automatically eligible if you meet that special criteria, so. So then we get back to some of the older programs that, and it kind of, it's like they add numbers to them. So the lower the number, usually they've been around the longer. Um, so like the CP1 was obviously the first one with a lot of brome we've gone from. But then we got the CP5A, which is a field windbreak. That's where Hunter, we said we could do two to 10 rows of trees at least two rows of pine trees. So once in a while you drive through the field um, and that's for wind erosion, you know, the prairie's got a lot of wind on it. And some of these wide open spaces, it's kind of nice to have not only for habitat, but that little bit of wind break. And this you can put around on the west and the north side. Those are the windward sides of a field. Um, and it really looks beautiful. You get a couple rows of those pine trees out there. Yeah, the, the CP8A is the grass waterway. We talked a lot about that already. Basically, you got that ephemeral <clears throat> gully or you got some washing in your field, give us a call. We'll come on out, survey it up, and put that nice parabolic waterway shape in there um, so you're able to cross it, keep that water flowing down a safe path, and get that area grassed up. Um, then you got the CP9, which is, uh, so we talked about those hydric soils and what percentages you could put it into that farmable wetland program, the CP2728. Um, and then there's also a CP20, well, I'm jumping ahead. But anyway, the CP9, you don't have to have the tighter soils, but it is an, a designed creation of a wetland. So we'll have someone design a, um, a berm and put in, it's kind of like doing a wetland, but 
Um, but it doesn't guarantee that it's going to hold water, but it will hold water for a certain amount of time um, on the landscape. So that's the CP9 shallow water area. Uh, CP12 is a food plot, and actually this is not really a standalone practice necessarily. It's something that we would pair with, and I'll, I'll jump ahead, I might be cheating here, but this is a practice that we'll pair with our CP38. We didn't talk a lot about that just because there's so many moving parts of it, but basically the long or the short of it, the CP38 is um, a program that we can put a larger area or a larger tract of ground into CRP. And this is going to be um, primarily your tall native grasses. It has changed where if we have a larger tract, we want to split that up into two different seeding types. And so we're going to have our tall native grasses and then we're going to have a short grass with a lot of forbs in that one CP38. But this that CP38 is a program that you're then eligible to use a food plot CP12 with. And that's something that we've been doing a lot with on um, this last couple of years is putting a lot of these CP38s in with food plots. So if you're interested in putting some food plots in with some CRP, that would be the avenue we go down. CP12 wildlife food plot. So then like the CP15A is what we would call the contour buffer strips. And that's kind of what we originally were laying these out on the contour of a field, which now with the CP43 is kind of, um, it's kind of like the CP15A contour buffer strips, but we have more flexibility in the size. Um, the 15A, usually we're doing uh, 30 foot strips through the field and the bottom strip was 60 foot wide. A um, lot more engineering and things went into that as far as layout and things. Whereas the CP43, and I'm going to cover that right when we're doing this, the 43 and the 15A are kind of similar, but we have more flexibility in the side of how the widths are on those. So that's strips through the field of a, of a, of a corn and soybean field. Uh, a CP16A is a shelter belt establishment. Um, that's what we talked about earlier again is that those rows of trees from a minimum of three rows up to a maximum of 16 rows. And so that gives us a lot of flexibility to maximize the, the number of species, the number of trees, um, whether it's around a farmstead in a crop field or around the edge of a field, whatever it may be, um, able to get some trees established on field edges. So CP16A shelter belt establishment. Then we got the CP17, that's the living snow fence. So this is kind of cool. So what we want to do is, you know, obviously um, winter's coming and uh, you get some of them blizzards and things like that. You'll see the DOT and the county guys put up some snow fence. So the idea is this is to have a living snow fence and a per more permanent type. So we'll design these that have like a hundred, you want to be a hundred feet um, from the edge of the road out. So then we'll put that into native prairie grass and then we'll put our rows of trees. And those are usually one to three rows. So it's not a lot of trees, but it's just like snow fence. Um, sometimes you'll see where they've left these rows of corn along a field, um, but a 17A, a living snow fence, which I think is kind of a, a neat little thing. We don't have many of them, but it is kind of a tool that we do have that we probably should promote it a little more. A mm -hmm. uh, CP21 filter strip. A lot of people are probably pretty uh, know about this program. They're pretty knowledgeable about it. They probably have one on their field. There's a lot of these around um, this is where we put a minimum of 20 foot up to a maximum of 120 foot along a stream. And so a lot of people um, don't like farming right up next to the stream. They don't like seeing their planters or their tillage equipment falling in. Um, and so having that native filter strip along those perennial streams is really important. And since um, these last couple of years, we've been able to, to now use those on bioreactors and saturated buffers. And so we'll talk a little bit more about those later on and what they are, but basically having that filter system whether it's a bioreactor, saturated buffer under the ground, that structure, and then having still your native grasses on top, the CRP program is then able to pay that 100% on those saturated buffers and filter strips while also getting that rental payment with your filter strip. So CP21 filter strip. So we're actually going to a bioreactor and a saturated buffer training today. So uh, we've been to them before, but we, we're going to make an entire podcast just about the edge of field practices in that. So the other one, so the CP21 is these buffer strips are 20 feet wide to 120 foot wide and they're grasses. The CP22 riparian buffer is where we can plant trees um, and that we got to go minimum of 30, is that 20? That one's 30, that's 35. Minimum of 35 feet, foot wide up to 180 foot wide. So, and so we're planting, you know, we're planting like four or 500 seedlings per acre. Um, you go in and plant those with a, um, a, a tree planter um, with bare root plants, but 
it uh, not as not as we were at one time Howard County led the state in the number of CP22s um, because we had a lot of pas creek pastures and stuff that you don't have to have cropping history is on that marginal pasture land so the CP22 is the riparian tree buffer the CP23 is a wetland restoration and it's kind of like the CP27 28 that we were talking about um, but it's a little bit different. There's a few more criteria that you need to meet um, within the, the practice to be eligible for this CP23. But we're basically able to take an area that's within that 100-year floodplain um, and do a, either a wetland enhancement, wetland restoration um, to get it enrolled in that program. Um, so CP23 or CP23A, wetland restoration. So we uh, so the other thing is just like that CP21 grass buffer, the tree buffer, it's, the CP31 is that bottomland timber. So we are, we're taking these fields that are down in that floodplain and every you know two or three years, they're four or five feet deep of water. It's very difficult to keep crops growing in those. So the CP31 is where we go in and we plant a, um, a wet loving tree. A lot of times we put cottonwoods, um, silver maple and some of that stuff um, that likes their feet wet. And uh, especially when we had some of these huge flooding events um, this is a nice way to get some return on that land that is kind of marginal. Um, a CP33 is a habitat buffer for upland birds. They're otherwise known, a lot of people know them as quail buffers. Um, this is kind of the practice that we had before the CP43. And so this was an area where we were able to put 30 to 120 foot of native grasses, um, usually around the field borders of the fields. Um, and it was great to take off those end rows, eliminate those point rows, whatever it may be. Um, and we did a lot of these, but since then we've, we've basically utilized the CP43 um, instead just because it's so much easier to, to navigate and enroll um, as far as a program standpoint. So that CP39, we were talking about the 27, 28, or 23, they have to be on fields where it's crop history um, in those, oh, those years in the hist back, back in where we planted corn and soybeans. The marginal pasture land practices, um, so one of those would be the CP39 where we can actually do one of these shallow um, wetland programs in the old pastures and things like that. The key is we have to have tile water feeding that. So the idea is to denitrify nutrients from tile water. So it's usually on the edge of a field down to, before you get to the creek, there'll be an area of pastures kind of flat in area and we can daylight that tile water into that before it gets to the stream. So the CP39 is a Kind of a wetland program in old pasture ground. Uh, the CP42 pollinator mix, uh, we already talked about that quite a bit, but it's pretty uh, cut and dry. Uh, minimum of a half acre up to a maximum of 10 acres. So um, a few years ago, we were able to do some whole fields up to 160 acres. Um, where now we've, we've uh, neglected that back down to 10 acres maximum, which is kind of nice because that's ultimately what the pollinators are looking for, are those small um, blocks of, of, of forbs and stuff like that. So the CP42 uh, pollinator. So I'm going to skip down to the last uh, two pasture programs we have. So prior <clears throat> prior to um, the CP29 and 30, the CP22 planting trees was our only option for those areas that didn't have crop history where the old pastures along the creeks. So this was a grass option. So we go in and we we're actually um, it's areas that we wouldn't plant to trees, we're planting to grasses. So you can do a, a buffer strip of 120 feet um, along a stream. Now the rental rates are much lower. They're the marginal pasture rental rate, which is about $80 an acre. Most of our cropland CRP is going to be in that $275 to $300 an acre. So, but for those people that aren't pasturing their streams or their stream corridors anymore, it's a wonderful way to change over that uh, grass type from the old bluegrass and brome and some of that stuff to get a more natural native mixes down through there. And then we can carry fires down through and kind of manage that stuff so it doesn't get all too woolly down there. Um, so that's been a, that was added in probably about 12, 15 years ago. And it was a nice option for those who didn't want to plant trees to where, where we can still, instead of plowing right down to the edge of the creek, we can take that land that was in that um, non crop history area and put that into a buffer strip. Awesome, yeah, so the, as you can tell, there's tons of different CRP uh, practice codes that you can try to enroll in. Um, and it really ultimately comes down to what you have in your field, what your goals are. And that's what we wanna take a few minutes now is I'm gonna try to present a couple different 
um, scenarios to Neil and have Neil navigate what I told him with my goals and whatever to which program maybe is, is, is the most uh, applicable um, for what I have in mind. And so mm-hmm. hopefully if you're listening to this, maybe you have an area of your farm, your field, your whole farm, whatever it may be that you want to enroll into the CRP program, you're just not quite sure. This is kind of how we go about it. So um, let's, let's shoot some examples. So uh, I got a small 10 acre farm. Um, and I got this just one five acre field and five acres of timber in this five acre field. I just don't know what to do with. It's too small to farm. Um, I, I, I can't get anyone to lease it from me. I don't have any equipment to farm. What can I do with this small five acre field? So you got a five acre field. <clears throat> it does kind of limit our, our, our pro- program options because some of them are 10 to 20 acres. So we're going to be looking at so I kind of go down our key here and we've got, what do we have that you can do at least five acres? Um, so it kind of cuts out our, our gaining ground and our pheasant recovery because you need 10 to 20 acres. Um, how many acres did you have? Five. Five. Man, you're a little farmer. But that's okay. We can do something because we have general CRP. So we're going to put together a general CRP bid for you. And uh, honestly, before we do that, it might be that you may want a little bit of habitat and we'll put one of these field windbreaks in. You know, if you want some windbreak around that five acre field, we can go in with the continuous program, put two to, you know, 16 rows of trees in around that edge for habitat. And then we've got maybe, that's probably gonna eat up two acres. <clears throat> we got three acres. We're gonna do a general CRP bid with uh, perhaps maybe a half acre food plot and voila now you've got a little habitat area you're going to do some hunting awesome thanks so obviously i did that one on purpose because i knew there was going to be some acre minimums that we weren't going to meet but Mm -hmm. uh, let's same example let's say i got five acres of timber five acres of crop ground Um, i'm building a house on that five acres of timber but my neighbor right across the fence line has 160 acres of grass am i able to put that seer or that little five acre field into any crp program then you have just found a loophole. <laughs> so with that, those minimums, let's say the minimum is 10 acres or 20 acres, and you've got just, like you said, a five acre field. If within conjunction uh, connecting adjacent to it, we can add that, let's say your neighbor's got five acres also, and they have it in general CRP, or maybe they've just got it in a REAP program that's in conservation cover. Now we've got, we can add that to the area to develop that 10 acres or 20 acres. <clears throat> now you're eligible for that CP38 program. And we're gonna probably put at least two different uh, grass species on there. We're gonna do a taller grass mix for some of that winter cover. And we're gonna have that shorter um, high pollinator, um, uh, high forb mix to, for some nesting ground. So yeah, so all of a sudden, boom, now you're, now you're in. Awesome. All right, example number two, I got a 160 acre field. Um, I was out combining this fall and I broke two tires off falling in this big gully and it runs all the way from the very top of my field all the way down to the very bottom of my field and this gully's got to be at least three foot wide and at least four foot deep. What am I going to be able to do about this? How would you like it if I had a program that would pay 100% of the cost, we're going to shape out a grass waterway, we're going to add a couple lines of tile along with it and you're not going to be, you're going to be sailing through that waterway because um, it's going to have a nice shape. And so uh, as soon as crops are off, give me a call. We're going to come out and flag that, and we're going to get a survey. We're going to get a proposal put together for you and an estimate. And I uh, can't see how you're going to go wrong um, instead of battling that erosive. And then I'm going to also let you know we're going to go from 45 tons an acre down to one ton. So if we got a <clears throat> waterway that's going to add up about three or four acres, that's a lot of soil leaving your farm. So you're going to have a an outstanding outcome when we do this transformation. That seems really awesome. I can't believe you guys are able to give me $300 an acre. I can't even grow a corn plant out there with that gully. But did you say you could put tile with that too? Absolutely, because part of that idea is we, you know, it's that concentrated flow and that's where all the water is migrating. <clears throat> so we're going to um, design that with how we're, the idea is just to keep those acres where the waterway is dry so that you can cross it in the spring and in the fall. I mean, if you're not going to be able to cross it, you're going to start farming up along it. And before long, the water's going to run along the sides and then it's going to be, the water's not going to get in the waterway. So yeah, we're going to, we're going to cost share having the tile put along. We're going to cost share your seating and we're going to put in um, either erosion blankets or fabric checks to 
ensure that that establishment time, we get that grass is growing before the next nine inch rain comes. Awesome. All right, another example. I got a I got 120 acres, um, but I got about a 30 acre area that I just can't get great crops off. I've tiled everything at 30 foot spacings. Um, I got that that 30 acres is always wet. Um, I thought about putting a pond in, but I had a contractor come out and it was going to cost me almost eighty thousand dollars to build a pond. And I can't afford to, to spend eighty thousand dollars on a pond that's not going to bring me any investment or return on investment back. Um, I just don't know what I'm going to do. I can't grow any crops out there. Well, I tell you what. Um, first off, I'm going to tell you you got to get bids. Got to get a lot of bids because it's competitive out there, and you're going to find a contractor that probably is going to be doing it for less than eighty thousand dollars. And uh, but yeah, we're going to talk to you about because it sounds like you got pretty wet soil, so you're probably going to have hydric. So I'm going to pull up your soils map. We're going to look and see what percentage of that area of the field is in, is hydric. And I think either if we're down in the floodplain, we're going to do a CP23, or if we're above that, we're going to do this 2728. We're going to put a fire break around it, and uh, we're going to uh, enhance your farm and get a, a nice return of 300 bucks an acre. And you're not going to have to deal with that wet last field that you're going to be able to plant and the last in the field that's going to give you grief in the fall trying to harvest what am i going to do with all my tile though like i said i have a i have a tile that 30 foot space and i put all this money into tile i don't want to just reroute it around the pond and, and dump it on my neighbor well we're not going to dump it on your neighbor we're going to daylight it into the shallow pond and then we're going to receive it and send it the same way you were sending it before. But aren't I going to add a bunch of nitrates and stuff to my pond? I don't want to nope. kill all the fish and stuff that's going to be in my pond. That is the, uh, well, we're not going to have fish in your pond. This pond is going to be for amphibians, tadpoles, and things like that. But, and waterfowl. But um, that denitrification of the water, leaving your tile land, tile ground, daylighting to that, we're going to send that water down the creek in a lot better condition than it was before. Awesome. Last one I got. So I got this 160 acre farm. Um, it farms really, really well, but I got some really bad gullies on the edges of my field. And I just have some terrible headlands that I, I, I just can't quite get them taken care of. Is there anything? Do you have a grass program or, or a hay program that I can put around the edges of my field? Do I have a program for you? Um, so what's your goal? Do you want to make hay off of it? Do you have livestock? Because if you want to do that, we've got a headlands program field border um, buffer program where we can go around the edge of your field 60 feet, <clears throat> take those headlands uh, end rows off. Especially a lot of times, when I assume on your farm, it's a hilly farm. We're going to plant everything in the contour, but what do we do on the end rows? We just do the opposite thing. So we're planting up and down the hill. So we're going to either, if you want hay, we're going to put that into the state headland program for five years. You're going to give you $300 to establish that hay. You're going to make hay off of it as often as you want. Or if you don't have cattle, we're going to enroll you into that CP43 program. We're going to take off those headland areas. You're able to turn on it. So we're going to take those end rows off and uh, we're going to have a nice uh, framed field for you to have access to mow it, access to plant it in a, in a way that you're not going up and down the hill. Awesome. That sounds great. And actually, I lied. I got one more. <laughs> Um, I just bought this farm that's 320 acres. It's got 160 acres of timber and 160 acres of, of row crop on it. But I want to turn it into a complete habitat sanctuary. I want to put some food plots out there. I want some really heavy uh, native cover for the, for the deer and the pheasants to hide out in over winter when the snow comes. But I also want to make sure that I have some area for the birds to, to rear in or to, to, to hatch in because that thick grass, I don't think those little chicks can navigate around. And I love when a guy like you shows up. <laughs> these are the most enjoyable. Um, I always say it's like a puzzle that we were putting together. And uh, you've described your your concerns. We've got a program exactly what meets what everything you were talking about. It's the CP38, uh, 4D. We're gonna do a uh, we're gonna do a, a mixture of tall grasses um, <clears throat> for winter cover and, and short grasses. <clears throat> we're gonna put a block of switchgrass out there so you have a really nice cover. And we're going to put those CP12 food plots next to those uh, blocks of switch grass. We're probably going to add a few um, areas of maybe some red cedar and things because pheasants love that. And on top of it, we're going to make this management easy for you. We're going to put a fire break around the perimeter of that. And we're also going to divide it up into four quadrants so that you can have um, burn those off so that you're not taking all your cover off in one year. Wow, that, sounds, that, sound? that sounds just phenomenal. 
Um, so obviously not every time we get examples or farmers come in, it's not quite that easy. Um, but nonetheless, I would say nine times out of 10, we're able to find something out there to make it work. Um, and so if you're listening to this and you got some ideas or some, some areas where you think, man, I really don't like farming this. It's really tough to farm. Um, I want some more habitat out there for my kids to go hunt. I want to go hunt, whatever it is. Come on in, shoot us some ideas. We'll try to make something work. Um, and that's what's so awesome about the CRP right now is that there is so much flexibility with it. Um, granted, sometimes you run into those walls where we can't quite figure something out, but um, there's always a, a second second idea or a plan B um, that we can usually go down and, and try to figure something out. So, And there's no plan too small or too large. <clears throat> um, you know, we've done contracts where we're a half an acre or two tenths of an acre. Um, we just got a small, small little point row or a little odd field or something or that little buffer or, or a grass waterway or we've got the whole field that we want to put in so um like i said we've got a our crp toolbox has got a lot of tools in it um we're we're here to um, serve you in any way to get that and we're to here to navigate the programs work with our fsa neighbors next door um to get you a contract and work with your contractors you choose and design a plan that uh, meets all your resource concerns and it's good for the environment, it's good for water quality, it's good for the habitat. And uh, like I said, we focus mostly on CRP, but we do have some uh, some of our state programs that we can do with some con conservation cover and stuff using the REAP program and, and some of that stuff. So, but, uh, and if we don't have the answer, we can find the answer for you because we have at our fingertip, um, we got biologists, um, we've got uh, experts in contracting and things like that. So um, we'll, uh, we'll, we're gonna do our best to to make sure that we can make something work for you. Not to say that every time we can make something work, once in a great while, there is something, but we, the, you know, the, the USDA has given us such a program to use um, and such a diverse um, package of different practices. I mean, I, we did skip over some of them because some of these have like a subcategory. And uh, so we kind of just hit the highlights as far as the main ones, but um, I think we've got close to <clears throat> 25, 30 different practices we can do just with the CRP program. Absolutely. And I mean, yeah, we're going on an hour and a half here, but and we, we always debate, God, we got to <laughs> almost do every practice individually, but we can dive into that later on. But it's mm -hmm. nice to just try to get everything together. Hopefully you got some time where you can sit down and really digest this podcast and, and put it in your brain and, and put some ideas together is what you might want to do. Yeah. Um, and before we sign off here, um, I guess we probably should give a, a shout, out, shout out. We had KIMT and Sean McAday came down last week um, and did a story on um, the award that I received a couple weeks ago and then also trying to promote our podcast for us. Mm -hmm. um, and he started off, I know we're going to have to pull it up here at the office once we come out, but um, he started right off the bat with the podcast and put in the intro in there. And That's great. Um, so hopefully if, if you're listening to this and um, you found this on KIMT, shoot us a thumbs up, shoot us a subscribe, let us know what you like, what you don't like. Uh, maybe you want to get on here and tell your story. Let us know. Um, we're always looking for guests. But uh, big thanks to, to KIMT and Sean McAday for, for coming on down and trying to promote this for us. Because um, that's ultimately why we, we talked about doing this podcast. Is yeah. We want to get this information out. And what's cool about CRP is this is a federal program. So whether mm -hmm. you're in Iowa, Minnesota, Virginia, wherever you're at, um, it, it should be fairly close to about the same. It's going to be a little different, but for the most part, it's going to be pretty darn close. Yeah. And be sure to hit that sub subscribe button so that you get the future ones that we have. This was kind of an overview. It was a lot, <clears throat> a lot to digest here, but it, it's such a great program. We, we knew we had to go a little bit over our, our usual hour long. But there's some really great stuff in here. Um, and uh, like I said, I, I've enjoyed it. I've worked with that. Our Soil and Water District pretty much uh, manages the program here um, between our summer intern our district technicians. I know like last week when Hunter was uh, um, filming with the KIMT, Riley Wilson and I were down at a watershed academy down in Des Moines, um, kind of learning some more stuff about some of these practices that we're doing. So I brought that back for Hunter. And, and um, but yeah, we're, we're always working. We just had um, some change up in our CP38 um, gaining ground program. So we're going to be implementing that on some of our re-enrolls this coming year. And uh, so, like I said, we've been studying up on it so that we got everything kind of, it's like I said, we're going to do the best that we, we can uh, get this stuff done to your, to your desires. Um, so it's our job to, to really learn up on, on the new programs and some of the changes that are out there. 
and uh, I think they're all for the best. I mean, we're we're getting a little more fine tuned to dial this stuff in, so we're uh, doing an even better job for what what we're doing is even better for habitat, better for water quality, and uh, financially better for the farmer. Hey Neil, and let's put Neil on the spot here. When you when we were working on the <coughs> conservation plans, what's that top line? Those three four aspects that you put on there. Um, when I was writing conservation plans, I've always liked to put on there. We're improving water quality, reducing soil erosion, enhancing wildlife habitat, and increasing net farm income. Because all four of those have to be um, tied in together, and we can do that. Ultimately, and that's exactly what CRP is doing, all four of those things. So uh, before we sign off here, don't forget, farm the best, buffer the rest, and we'll catch you next Tuesday on the Beyond the Dirt podcast.